Member statements. The member for Toronto St. Paul's. Education is a human right. It is through education that we learn ourselves, our history, and we begin to envision our futures. Black children have systematically been exposed to an erasure of their identity in Ontario's school curriculum. This is anti-black racism upheld by the Ontario government. Black lives cannot be blocked out history any longer. Black history curriculum must be mandatory in every Ontario school from K-12. to Ontario Black History Society sent the Minister of Education a copy of a 2016 Grade 8 history textbook used to teach grade 8 students across Ontario. Of 255 pages, when non-black history is blocked out, only 13 partial pages remain that mention black history. 13 mentions for 400 years of black lives here. OBHS has asked the Minister of Education to immediately commence a review of the social studies, histories and geographies in Canadian and world studies curriculum. Work with black educators and scholars to conduct the review and identify topics, themes and content to be integrated into the curriculum. Include black history and black experience as mandatory learning in the SSHG and CWS curricula from K-12 and in all subjects from K-12. Provide consistent supports and resources to enable educators to effectively teach black histories. As a proud member of the Ontario Black Caucus and the MPP for Toronto St. Paul's, home to Little Jamaica, and NIA Centre for the Arts, which is building Canada's first professional multidisciplinary black arts centre, I wholeheartedly support Ontario Black History Society's call to action. Will this Minister of Education do the same, yes or no? Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm proud to rise this morning in the House to speak about our government's $25 million investment in the stem cell transplantation unit at Juravinsky Hospital and Cancer Care in Hamilton. I spoke at the official opening at the unit on Friday, and this is wonderful news for the world-class cancer care team at Juravinsky and, of course, for their patients. It allows more cancer patients to receive treatment closer to home. This means that patients will receive care in the right place at the right time. The investment will support a 15-bed inpatient unit for patients undergoing stem cell transplants and other complex malignant hematology cancer treatments. There will be additional treatment bays for oncology day services and a renovated pharmacy to support the growth of the expanded stem cell transplant program. Hamilton Health Sciences is renowned for its work in life-saving cancer care and stem cell transplant. The stem cell unit builds on the extraordinary history of cancer treatment in Hamilton. This investment also builds on our government's commitment to reduce wait times for critical cancer treatment. The talented and dedicated professionals at Juravinsky should be proud of their many achievements. I certainly am. Member state statements. The member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the critic for colleges and universities this morning, I sent an email to all members of this House urging them to not support the accreditation of Canada Christian College. In Bill 213, the, the government is granting the college and its owner, Charles McVitie, the ability to offer arts and science degrees in Ontario. This is despite Mr. McVitie being well known for espousing hateful and bigoted views. Mosques in Toronto have received threats and called on this government to combat Islamophobia, yet this Premier supports a man who is vocally anti-Islam. The LGBTQ2 plus community has fought hatred for years, yet this Premier supports a man who's made absolutely vile statements against the LGBTQ community. The Premier states that this is an independent decision, but if that were the case, he would not be using this bill to bypass the independent accreditation process. It's been revealed that Mr. McVitie and his son have taken personal loans from the college of over half a million dollars, and his wife, a vice principal of the college, awarded herself the title of doctor despite having no credentials. Regulatory authorities have consistently challenged the academic integrity of the college and rejected gra graduates due to suspicious academic transcripts and degrees being conferred before coursework was completed. Bill 213 attacks Ontario's communities and undermines our our accreditation process. I strongly urge all members of this House to vote against Bill 213. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. We want everyone, especially people with disabilities and seniors, to be able to fully participate in everyday life in communities. 
The government's public education campaign launched last week by the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility will help foster understanding and encourage cultural change towards accessibility needs. This campaign speaker is intended to help people learn more about accessibility, inclusion, and most importantly, hiring people with disabilities. This campaign speaker is part of the government's ongoing work to create a more inclusive and accessible province through the Advancing Accessibility and Ontario Framework. Speaker, the government is continuing to work with stakeholders like the Ability Centre in Whitby, partner ministries, broader public sector organizations, businesses, and other non-profit organizations to achieve these goals. Speaker, and in the process, helping people of all abilities participate fully in their communities' recreational, social, and economic life. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, November is Diabetes Awareness Month, and on Saturday, people around the world marked 100 years since Sir Frederick Banting's remarkable 25-word idea scribbled at 2 a.m. in his small bedroom above his medical practice on Adelaide Street in London, now the home of Banting House National Historic Site. That idea would lead to one of the greatest triumphs of modern medicine, the discovery of insulin in 1921, saving millions of lives and making Banting the only Canadian and the youngest person ever to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. While amazing progress has been made in the century since Banting's idea, COVID-19 has reinforced how much more we have to do. It has revealed the urgency of addressing poverty, food insecurity, and other key health inequities to improve health outcomes. Ontarians most at risk of COVID-19 are often those most at risk of diabetes, those who struggle with poverty, Poverty, who are racialized or Indigenous, who are food insecure, who live in crowded conditions, who work in low-wage essential jobs. They also face a significant economic burden, with high deductibles for the Trillium drug program, unable to afford proper foot care, unable to access continuous glucose monitoring systems, unable to pay for essential diabetes supplies, lacking private insurance plans, or with limited coverage. This centenary, what better way to honour Banting's legacy than by implementing a comprehensive provincial diabetes strategy, one that includes universal pharmacare and provides funding for all necessary supports. Thank you, Speaker. Member Statements. The member for Glengarry Prescott-Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Ambre, we are proud of Véronique Ducaire, a singer recognized worldwide. She is admired in the entire world. She's also from Ambre, and she grew up in Saint, Saint Joseph Street. She's our superstar, and last week she won a Felix Prize at the Adisk, her very first Felix. Uh, she's an international sensation, and for good reason, an incredibly talented impersonator, singer, actress, and uh, TV host. She's well known to recreate uh, with outstanding accuracy the greatest voices of Canada, the, the United States, and uh, Europe. She rose to international fame uh, after being discovered by Céline Dion, who's also my distant cousin, small world I know, and uh, René Angelil in 2008. She performed the opening act for Céline's Taking Chances tour for the Montreal um, and Quebec City shows, and the rest is history. Félicitations, Véronique, pour ton prix. Congratulations, Véronique, for your prize, but also for your great success. We are proud of you. You are the best. Just like groupies, we support you, and we congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise today in the House and bring attention to an important virtual event that is happening in my riding as we speak. November is Women Abuse Prevention Month. Abuse can either be a threat of violence or an actual form of violence, and sadly, many women experience the most common form, which is physical and sexual violence. In my writing, we have dedicated organizations to help women overcome the experiences with violence. Women who need help can rely on the services and resources provided by Savis of Halton or Halton Women's Place. Both Savis and Halton's Women's Place have changed the lives of many women here in Oakville and Halton, and they will continue to for the years ahead.
Today at 10 a.m., in honour of the victims who have suffered intimate partner violence, the Halton Women's Place and Halton Regional Police Board are joining together to host a virtual event to unveil a beautiful memorial that will be located at the headquarters of the Halton Regional Police. The Halton Police, under the great leadership of Chief Stephen Tanner, go above and beyond to keep the residents of Oakville safe. They are working diligently within Halton to protect women from human trafficking and domestic violence. Even though I cannot attend this virtual event, it's still important to recognize the victims of partner violence, especially during Women Abuse Prevention Month. We all have a role to play and need to take a stand to end violence against women. No woman should have to live in fear about whether they will face abuse. Education, prevention, and early intervention are critical in putting an end to women's abuse. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Kiwetanong. Speaker, uh, this week is uh, Treaties Recognition Week in Ontario. I would like to uh, stand here and say good words about how Ontario respects and honours treaties, but I cannot. We have a problem, Speaker. Ontario continues to fail to live up to its the terms, agreements, the spirit, and the intent of the treaties. So today, I recognize just a couple of failures. The Skanaga continues to be under boil bo water advisory, as it has been uh, since February 1995. Ontario signed Treaty Number no. 9 with the Skanaga and the Crown. Multiple First Nations across Ontario are taking legal action against Ontario to uphold their treaty rights under Bill 197. And the signatories of the Robinson Superior and Robinson Huron Treaties of 1850 are also in court with Ontario. Ontario has failed to increase the annuity payments for the, land, the use of lands and resources, as it was written in the Robinson Treaties. There has been no, ch no change in the annuity since it has set at $4 per person in 1874. In the Six Nations uh, territory, they have asked for a process to address the historical land claims with the federal and the provincial governments with no answer. Most importantly, I recognize and honor the resilience of those who are speaking up to make, uh, make our betters, uh, communities better and uh, for the, the justice that they work towards. We've been here for generations. We are here today. We will be here tomorrow. Honor the treaties. Miigwech. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, the Premier and I had the privilege to welcome Sarah and Max from the Como Foundation to Queen's Park to thank them for their hard work during this difficult time. This September, we were honoured to attend a ribbon-cutting ceremony at their new 9,000-square-foot facility. This facility, owned by CEO Bob Murray from McRae Imaging, has now moved most of their operations to making masks. By collaborating with the Como Foundation, they were able to produce the mask that I wear every day for the deaf and hard of hearing community. As the Premier has mentioned, their operations all started back in March on their dining room table. A few weeks later, the Como Foundation announced a $5 million donation to the Trillium Health Partners. The donation is part of a total commitment of $25 million over the next five years, providing a meaningful step closer to building a new hospital for Mississauga Lakeshore. This collaboration and generosity reflect the true chapter and spirit of Ontario. It makes me proud to be their MPP. It makes me proud to be Canadian, and I hope it will inspire us as we co confront the second wave of COVID-19, because it is only through this creativity and generosity of ordinary Ontarians like Max and Sarah that we will win this battle and ensure Ontario comes back stronger, more prosperous, and more united than ever. Thank you. Well member statements. The member for Kitchener, South Hespler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This morning, I rise as we begin our month of remembrance and want to acknowledge just how grateful we are for the immense sacrifice that tens of thousands of brave women and men have made to ensure that we have the freedoms we have today. This weekend, Canadians across the country felt the pain of the loss of a 29-year-old soldier who died in a live fire training accident at the Canadian Forces Base in Wainwright, Alberta. Corporal James Choi of BC has been described as one of the most dedicated members of his unit and was well respected by all of his comrades. Like many families, many of my relatives have died for service in our country. 
My mom's aunt, Lena Forrestal, was a Silver Cross mother at the National War Memorial in 1958. She lost three of her sons in the war effort. Warrant Officer Class II Daniel Forrestal died in 1943, and her sons Warrant Officer Class Thomas Forrestal and Flying Officer Robert Forrestal, who both died in 1944. My great uncle, Lieutenant William Dahl, also died in 1962 when his plane went down on a training mission just outside of CFB Trenton. My cousin Paul Trimble retired this past summer after 28 years of service with the Royal Canadian Navy. He and his family have scars that will last a lifetime. The months spent apart, the nights worrying and losing numerous close friends in Afghanistan. It is for these amazing men and women and their families that we are modernizing the Soldiers' Aid Commission in Ontario to expand assistance to veterans of all ages and their families who are in need of financial support. Mr. Speaker, may we honour them and may we remember them every day. Thank you very much. That concludes our member's statements for this morning. The member